morning, and we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your everlasting love. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. Lord, we do ask that you would minister to our hearts today, Father, as we open up your word. We ask that you would be with the missionaries, Lord, that this church is affiliated with and all of them, Lord, that you would just uh, minister to them and through them, Father. Lord, I also want to lift up Angel's grandson, Jacob. He's going to be going uh, away to college at uh, Berkeley, and he needs your prayers. He needs our prayers. Father, be with him, Lord. Those things that you've established with him at a young age to know you, Father, he needs to take that with him to school there, Father. We ask that he would shine for Jesus. Lord, once again, be with us this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I have the honors of sharing this morning, so <laughs> you'll, see it. you'll see after. <laughs> Let's go ahead and uh, turn the Bible to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be going through the text in Philippians. And keep, keep your spot there. We are going to turn to some other texts, but Philippians chapter 3, we're going we're to just spend all majority of our time in chapter 3 this morning. Some brief background regarding Philippians, since we're jumping into the middle of the book. Paul visited Philippi on a second missionary journey. And uh, on that journey, we know of a couple of people that got saved. We know Lydia got saved and her family and the Philippian jailer and his family. And then shortly after that visit, a church was established in Philippi. It's clear that Paul wrote this letter from prison. It doesn't state which prison, but most scholars believe that the prison was in Rome. Although there's many exhortations and challenges that are given, there's one major theme in Philippians, and that's living the Christian life. In chapter 1, Paul encourages the saints at Philippi to go on living the Christian life. In chapter 2, Paul set forth Timothy, Epaphroditus, and himself as examples of how to please God and live the Christian life. Chapter 3 there was encouragement necessary for those who would lead such a life. And in chapter 4 is the enablement for living the Christian life. I think that each one of us need exhortation and encouragement in leading the Christian life. One that pleases God. I know that I need that urging. I need that encouragement. Let's read verse 1. Finally, my brethren... Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Paul's writing to the believers here in Philippi. It says, finally, my brethren, or finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It says rejoice in the Lord, not rejoice in your circumstance. Oftentimes, it's extremely difficult to rejoice in a circumstance, if not impossible. I lost my job, or I just got served papers, or you just found out that somebody, a loved one, has a serious medical condition. It's hard to rejoice in circumstances, but we can always rejoice in the Lord because he's above our circumstances. It says in Romans 8.28 that we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We may not fully understand how, but his word says, all things work together for good. What does all things mean? We doubt that often, but it does. It means all things. That verse in the New Living Translation says, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. There's always cause to rejoice in the Lord. Paul tells them this to safeguard their faith. Paul said that he never gets tired of telling them these things. We need to take 
our eyes off the temporal, the circumstance, and focus on the eternal, the Lord. And then in verse 2, it says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now, immediately after telling him to rejoice in the Lord, he's warning him about false teachers. He's telling them to be aware of the things that may take away our joy. He's telling them about the demands of the Gentiles to be circumcised, to be saved, the legalists. That's what beware of the dogs. It was a harsh reference to the legalists who attempted to deceive the Philippians. He used the word dogs as it was the same term that the Jewish influenced legalists would use against the Gentiles. He considered their work dangerous and not of God. The believers were not to follow these people, but to be aware of them, to watch out for them. Verse 3 says, We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. These Jewish legalists, they considered themselves the only true circumcised and right with God. But Paul declares here in verse 3, that he and his followers were the true circumcision. Those of the true circumcision, they worship God in the spirit, their joy is not found in their own ability to be justified by the law or by keeping the law. Jesus and Jesus alone is their joy. They have no confidence in the flesh. What God is interested in is that our hearts be circumcised that we have hearts after the spirit and not after the flesh. Keep your place here and turn with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Paul says that in his flesh, nothing good dwells. The good that he wills to do, he doesn't do. And the evil that he wills not to do, that's what he does. That's why our hearts need to be circumcised. We have a sinful nature. Don't have confidence in the flesh. We need to rely on what Jesus has done for us. And right after Paul talked about not having confidence in the flesh, he shared in verse 4 that if anyone had a right to boast in the flesh, he had more of a right. He knew that he was more qualified to be justified by keeping the law than the legalists had. Jesus said in Matthew 20 in the Sermon on the Mount, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 5 it says, He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul's birth and ancestry were spotless, according to the Jewish standards. He was circumcised the eighth day. God made a covenant with Abram, as stated in Genesis 17, that he would make of his descendants a great nation, that they would be his people and he would be their God. And the sign of this covenant would be circumcision. Out of the stock of Israel... 
He was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore heir to God's covenant with them of the, tar- of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was born Jewish. He didn't convert to Judaism. A Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Hebrew, born of Hebrew parents. He retained the Hebrew language as mentioned in Acts chapter 22. Paul then listed several things concerning the law, and these were his personal choice and conviction. Even more reason to have confidence in the flesh. Paul was a Pharisee. They were the most religiously conservative group of Jews in the time. They were known for strictly following Jewish laws and customs. These Pharisees were sort of like trained athletes. They devoted their lives to these spiritual goals. Concerning zeal, Paul persecuted the church. In the New Living Translation, it says, I was so zealous zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. He brutally persecuted Christians before Acts chapter 9, when he got converted. Acts 22.20 says, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In legalistic righteousness, Paul excelled. In fact, in his own eyes, he was faultless or blameless in regards. But what Paul's saying in these verses is that if there's anyone that's able to claim that they're able to please God through keeping the law and the works of the flesh, it would be him. No one would question his character regarding. Verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. These verses are a big contrast to the preceding verses. Verse 7, Paul basically says that worldly qualifications in 5 and 6, he counted as loss for Christ. The New Living reads for this verse, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. All of this background that put Paul in high standing as far as the law is concerned, he counted as loss for Christ. These gains were worse than useless, actually. They were a hindrance because they also had to be unlearned. Verse 8, says, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Paul seems to expand the thought a bit. Not only does he agree with what he had just said in the verse, in verse 7, regarding his past qualifications, but he takes it a step further and says that he counts presently all things lost for knowing Christ. It wasn't so much that those things were worthless in and of themselves, but compared to the greatness of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, they were nothing. They were rubbish. Paul used harsh language here. The word rubbish means dung, worthless, detestable. In exchange for confidence in the flesh, Paul gained the exceeding greatness of knowing Christ Jesus personally. What Paul lost was a standing amongst the Pharisees, the self-righteousness. And what he gained was a right standing before the Lord, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Nothing else really mattered to Paul any longer. Having Christ as his Savior and Lord far surpassed all that he had in Judaism. The end of verse six, or the end of verse eight and verse nine says that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul wanted both 
to gain Christ as well as be found in him. These words show the idea of receiving and being, being included with Jesus. Christ is in the believer and the believer in Christ. Paul wanted his life to dem demonstrate these truths. Being in Christ, he wasn't clinging to any righteousness of his own doing associated with law-keeping. He realized that works would never be sufficient to cover his sins. Instead, he could only know God by faith in Christ. This is part of Paul's reason for referring to works and rituals as rubbish in the previous verse. In Isaiah 64, 6, it said that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Verse 3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus is the end of the law for those who believe. The law ends for the believer in the sense that our obedience to the law is no longer the basis for our relationship with God. The foundation for Paul's spiritual life was in Jesus and what he had done for him. Not in anything that Paul had done in the past, the present, or the future. And the second part of verse 9 emphasizes faith two more times. Our righteousness is through faith in Christ. From God through faith. Faith is the only thing that makes us right with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I praise the Lord that my righteousness is not based on me. It's based on him and what he did on the cross. All I need to do is believe. Verse 10 in Philippians 3, it says that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul, in his legalistic and religious days, he knew of God theologically as well as intellectually. And in these verses, he shares how he wanted to know him more intimately as his Lord. The word know in Greek is gnosko, which means to know by experience. And Paul was sharing with the Philippians here because his desire was to know Jesus. He also wanted them to know Jesus more, not just doctrinally, but personally and experientially. You know, we can say that we know someone because we have seen them. We know their physical traits. We can say that we know someone because... Maybe they come across our, crossed our path a lot, like our, our mailman. We're familiar with them. We can say that we know someone because we talk with them. We can say that we know someone because we go over to their house or go on a date with them. And we can say that we know someone because we're married to them. We spend much of our time with them. We have conversations with them. We're committed to them. But there's a way of knowing Jesus that goes beyond all of that. Paul wanted to know the power of his resurrection, as stated in verse 10. For Paul, the resurrection was not just a past historical event. It had continuing dynamic power, dynamus, that enabled believers to live the Christian life victoriously. That divine power is available to us today. Paul wrote in Romans 8.11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Power is the 
ability to overcome resistance. And we need that power as the world continues to pull at us. Paul notes the importance of sharing in his sufferings. Many believers think that the Christian faith provides freedom from hardship. We know it's false. Paul knew it as well as the early church. They knew that there would be hardship and suffering, but they also knew that living for Christ, there would be joy. Here, Paul wants to identify with Christ's suffering. Paul was no stranger to, stu- a stranger to suffering despite his faithful service to Jesus. In verse 10, Paul also wants to be conformed to his death. He wanted to be fully conformed to Christ's likeness, even unto his death. And then in verse 11, Paul shares, If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Many views have, given, have been given regarding uh, what Paul means in this particular phrase. And one commentary said, The simplest view follows Paul's progression from verse 10. Resurrection, which is new life in Christ. Sufferings, death. And then here in verse 11, resurrection from the dead. A future reference to the resurrection of the dead. Though this is consistent with the view of the rapture, Paul doesn't appear to be specific to the rapture itself in these words and speaks more generally about his future resurrection from the dead. Eternal glory. Verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. In verse 12, Paul wants to let believers in Philippi know that he's a work in progress that he has not fully attained the goals that were in verses 10 and 11. There are plenty of people today that feel that they've attained the place that they want to be in their spiritual walks. Paul wrote this, a spiritual giant by all means, and yet he says that he hasn't achieved these things or reached perfection. Spurgeon said, but while the work of Christ for us is perfect, And it were presumption to think of adding to it, the work of the Holy Spirit in us is not perfect. It's continually carried on from day to day and will need to be continued throughout the whole of our lives. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I was thinking of pressing on and a while ago, Uh, Gabe and I, we um, attempted to climb Mount Whitney, the Mountaineers route. We we had already done the regular route. Regular route is about 21 miles, and the Mountaineers route is 8.8 miles, same vertical elevation gain. Um, Mountaineers route's no marked trails. So uh, when we did did it the first time, we uh, it blizzarded at us at the uh, base camp. So turned around and went home, and then. uh, Multiple years later, probably older than we should have been, we uh, said, okay, let's, let's uh, go for it again. So this time we picked up a couple buddies, Shane and Toby, and they, uh, they were planning on doing it with us. So we put all the gear together. We had the, you know, everything needed, the crampons, the ice axes, backpacks, ropes, um, tents, bear cans, everything that you need. And uh, we said, okay, let's go. As we got to base camp, uh, Shane, he got altitude sickness, so he had to stay at base camp. So the three of us, Gabe, Toby, and I, we uh, ascended, the, not the face, but just to the side of the face. And when we were literally 300 feet from the top, 
Toby said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going any further. And Gabe and I, it's like, press on, dude. <laughs> Seriously? We got 300 feet. So basically, we had two options. Press on and make it to the summit, leave our friend behind, or descend. Needless to say, Gabe wants to do it again. <laughs> yeah. But Paul realized that he was not at the summit. He had not arrived. Paul, the spiritual giant, saying, but I press on. He's encouraging these believers in Philippi to press on. There's no turning back for him. Paul said, I press on to possess that perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are w which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Again, the goal here is perfection. Paul says again that he hasn't reached it. He isn't faultless, doesn't expect to reach perfection before he dies. But the verse says that he forgets those things that are behind and reaches forward to those things which are ahead. Paul was focused on the things which were ahead. He wouldn't let those things behind him distract him. You know, less than two weeks ago, uh, I was watching some of the Olympics and happened to tune into a track event. And it was the, I think they call it the 200 meter dash. It was, a, it was actually a heat. And we had a world record holder, um, Noah Lyles, in the heat. And the first two, they automatically advance. And then it's based on time. And as I was watching, he was like way out in front. I was like, oh my goodness, this guy is fast. And then about 15 meters before the end, he coasted. He shut it down. And I was thinking, his eyes weren't set on the finish line. You have to run through the finish line. You don't coast. Well, he got to the finish line, and it was a photo finish, and he got third place. He, he, he was so far in front, but he, he didn't finish well. And um, he wound up being in the final event because that heat's times were so good. But he was more focused on the people behind him, not, he, he wasn't, he thought that they were further back. He was contemplating these things in his mind instead of focusing on what was ahead. And that happens to us all the time. Living in the past, there's always a danger of discouragement, which shuts off initiative for the future. We can learn from the past, but we're not attached to the things that we've done. That's pretty comforting. Instead of being bound by our past mistakes, we can move forward knowing that we carry Christ's forgiveness. On the other hand, a person may look back in their victories of the past and they're resting on their accomplishments. They're always looking at their past and not doing anything presently. And I think of the many people that come into the front office and a lot of them say, yeah, I used to be over at Calvary in the big tent back in the day. And inevitably, where are you at now? Well, you know, uh, focused on the past. We need to be focused on the future. The past has been wonderful. It's been exciting to see what God's done. But you know what? I'm more excited to see what God is going to do on what lies ahead. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. New Living Translation says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Paul was focused on winning the prize to which God had called him. It says in Colossians 3.2, Paul wrote this, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And 1 Corinthians 9.24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Paul is encouraging the Philippians, but he's also encouraging each one of us to run in such a way to obtain the prize. What is the prize? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The prize is the crown of righteousness. In Revelation 2.10, it says, the prize is the crown of life. 1 Peter 5.4, it says, the prize is the crown of glory. This prize is obtainable by anyone, is it not? The upward call is only in Christ Jesus. The legalists did things in their flesh, not in Christ Jesus. In verses 12 to 14, Paul discussed how his life was a work in progress. Paul wasn't perfect, and he knew it. Rather than dwelling on the past, he was committed to the future. In verse 15, it says, Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And it, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Verse 14, Paul said, I pressed toward the goal for the prize. And here in verse 15, he transitions and said, let us. He didn't say, let me, let us. Paul wanted the Philippians to know that it was for each one of them, not just him. Paul said, as many as are mature. Those who are mature will have the same mind. Paul trusted that God would guide them to maturity as well that he would reveal it to them. Paul expected the Philippian believers, or each one of us, the readers of the letter, to join him in pursuing Christ above everything else. This should be the goal for every believer, not only those who serve or are in some type of leadership or ministry, but for each one of us. He's saying, forget the things behind and press on to the prize. Verse 16 says, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. This seems to be an encouragement to those that may not be walking the same way. He seems to encourage them to not fall back on their sinful practices. He didn't want them to lose ground. Paul says in Philippians 2.2, 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He wanted them to enjoy a Christ-filled life just as he was. It wasn't easy. As we mentioned earlier in the study, Paul had the joy of the Lord and it wasn't necessarily the circumstances. He knew that if they were like-minded, having the same love, that they too would have the same joy. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have, a, have us for a pattern. Paul isn't egotistical in saying that we should follow his example he said in verse 12 that he had not attained or was not perfected. Paul said, not only follow his example, but learn from those who walk in the same manner. After this encouragement to follow Paul as an example, he shares with the Philippians how many others walk. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. 
Paul was so concerned about the Philippians' spiritual welfare that he warned them often and even wept for them. Paul didn't say some walk. He said many walk contrary to what was taught. He's even called them enemies of the cross. Paul was weeping for the unsaved. He wasn't referring to the legalists here. He was referring to the lost. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The people that Paul was referring to here didn't want to follow Jesus by taking up the cross of self-denial. They wanted to indulge in the flesh. It says that their end is destruction. That's why Paul was weeping. Paul had a heart of compassion for the lost. And then verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul's saying, let's not get too attached to this world. Keep a light grip on it. The people of Philippi were living there as colonists, while their citizenship was that of Rome. Just as the Philippians were Roman citizens under Roman laws and traditions, Christians should also consider their citizenship to be that of heaven. Hebrews 11 reminds us, us of some of the Old Testament saints. And in verse 13 of Hebrews 11, it says that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Then in Hebrews 11:16, it says that they desire a heavenly country. They were looking for the eternal kingdom of God. Instead of temporary things on earth, a believer's focus is on Christ and his return, eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the eternal kingdom of God. In closing this morning, we need to remember that this chapter wasn't just for the Philippian church. It was for each one of us. Rejoice in the Lord, not in your circumstances, but the Lord. Beware of the dogs, the legalists, those trying to deceive. Don't have confidence in the flesh. Rely on what Jesus has done for you. Worldly qualifications are counted as loss for Christ. Our own righteousness is as filthy rags. However, we receive true righteousness from God through faith in Christ. Try to know everything you can about Jesus. As far as our spiritual walks, we're works in progress. Press on. Don't turn back. Stay focused on what lies ahead. Run in such a way as to obtain the prize. Let's all walk by the same rule. Be of the same mind. Follow the example that has been set before us and be an example to others. Don't indulge in the flesh. And as believers, I ask the question, where's our citizenship? Amen. Heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you that our citizenship is in heaven. That we can have joy in you in spite of our circumstances. Lord, we just, uh, we want to know more about you, Lord. We want to be built up in our faith, Father. We want to run in such a way as to obtain the prize. We want to be fixed and focused on the finish line, not worrying about those behind. Lord, minister to our hearts, Father. We thank you so much for Paul, just for this encouragement to the Philippian church, as well as for each one of us, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord, that, that we would take these things and that we would grow in our faith through you, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand.